Good morning, I'm Harley Schlanger from the LaRouche Organization with your daily update for January 4th, 2022. Well, as we've been discussing the strategic situation on the need for a breakthrough, we're seeing some fairly interesting developments, uh, including a statement issued by the UN Security Council Permanent Five members that was posted on their websites yesterday, the Five Nations. And what it says is a formulation that originally came from a Reagan-Gorbachev meeting, which was reaffirmed by a, the July Putin-Biden uh, summit. And it's a comment, quote, nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought, unquote. Now, the timing of this is significant because of the confrontation which has been building over Ukraine, between the NATO countries and Russia, but also toward China in the South China Sea and Taiwan. We've seen an acrimonious hostility coming from Western nations, the transatlantic nations, accusing both Russia and China of authoritarian methods of bullying neighbors, and in the case of, of uh, Russia with Ukraine, massing troops preparing for an invasion. Uh, this led to a couple of uh, video conferences between Biden and Putin on December 7th and then again at the end of the year, and a series of meetings coming up next week between leaders of the two nations. Now, given the threats and the danger, it's important that there be a statement that there must never be a nuclear war between uh, nations And the declaration is uh, part of a longer statement, which talks about pursuing, quote, bilateral and multilateral diplomatic approaches to avoid military confrontations, and further to pursue constructive dialogue with mutual respect and acknowledgement of each other's security interests and concerns, unquote. This is significant because Putin has insisted that the United States and NATO must recognize security concerns of Russia regarding the encroachment on its territory of NATO forces moving into Eastern Europe and Ukraine. So the fact that there's an acknowledgement that on each side there are security interests and concerns which must be taken into account as part of a dialogue process, this is a step toward possible resolution. Now, there's something, though, a little more ominous behind it, which is the sudden recognition of transatlantic war hawks that by putting pressure <clears throat> on Russia and China, they are driving those two countries closer together. In other words, they see this as a geopolitical problem, that in order to blunt what they see as aggression from Russia and China, which, as we'll get to in a moment, is really not aggression at all. But in order to stop that, you cannot act in such a way that pushes those two countries together into a military alliance. Let me give you a, a sample of some of the, the comments here. Uh, there was an op-ed on an Israeli site by Dr. Peter Vincent Pry, who's the executive director of the Task Force on National and Homeland Security. And what he essentially says is that given the emergence of the Russia-China military alliance, the U.S. would lose a war with Russia and therefore must instead negotiate with the Russians to avoid a war. Well, that's one way of looking at it. Uh, it it's an obvious point. But uh, you'll see that this is reinforced by several other statements from just the last couple of days. That appeared on January 2nd. A day earlier, a colleague of Prize, uh, David Pine, has an op-ed in the National Interest uh, website. And what he says is that in order to avoid a world war with Russia and China, Biden should negotiate the peace agreements with Russia. So he's urging, this, this character David Pine, a former military officer, is urging that Biden accept on some level the, the insistence of Putin for security guarantees regarding NATO encroachment uh, uh, eastward onto the Russian border. Again, this is a negative 
negative. In other words, they're saying we shouldn't do this because of the negative consequences of a possible war, not raising the broader issues of should we be engaged in this kind of confrontation with Russia and China at all. Uh, another comment on this, Frederick Kemp, the chairman of the Atlantic Council, which is one of the war hawk uh, organizations, uh, British-American uh, institution that, that's constantly putting forward uh, geopolitical confrontations with Russia and China as necessary. Uh, he did an interview on CNBC where he warned that the Putin-Xi alliance is a very serious one. And you have to consider that in regard to the crises in Ukraine and Taiwan. Then on January 2nd, the Wall Street Journal had a lengthy article talking about the danger of a Russia-Beijing Russia alliance. And the ultimate point in the article is that we have to split Russia and China from each other. And they suggest the way to do that would be to soften the approach to Moscow in order to pull Russia away from China. And again, this would include some kind of agreement on Ukraine. Now, in all cases uh, that I've just mentioned, these are essentially the works of geopoliticians. They're not based on a, a method by which you can achieve a lasting peace. Uh, they recognize, on the one hand, that by threatening Russia and China, you are pulling them closer together as part of a military alliance, and that this would be a problem because together they're stronger both economically and militarily than the transatlantic powers, uh, and, and therefore if there were a war, it would either go to full-scale nuclear war, in which everyone loses, or if it was a conventional war, the West would lose. Now, what's, what they're missing is what is it that's actually drawing Russia and China together? Not the threats from the West, but the impetus for economic integration of the Eurasian continent, which is the intent of the Belt and Road Initiative, which is really the, the idea that Lyndon LaRouche put forward back in 1988-89, when it was clear that the Soviet Union would collapse, and LaRouche's proposal was for the West to work with Russia and China for full-scale economic integration, not just in Eurasia, but between Eurasia and Western Europe. Now, that's a solution to the war danger. Collaboration, working together to build on energy independence for countries, to have a mix of cultures, cultural exchange, uh, industrial development, and so on. But that's, unfortunately, what geopoliticians fear. Geopolitics is essentially the, uh, based on the, uh, the fear that the power of the West depends on subordinating most of the world to the terms of trade and the rules of engagement of a unipolar world. This is what it was when Mackinder introduced it at the end of the 19th century. This is what led to two wars in the 20th century, all the regional wars since the end of World War II, all have been based on preventing alliances of nations of Western Europe with Eastern Europe into Eurasia connecting with China and Russia. So the idea of preventing an alliance in the heartland, which was Mackinder's language, is what's driving geopoliticians today. So their, their concern is that if you have a Russia-China alliance, it will uh, squeeze out the power or cut back the power of the city of London and Wall Street to loot the rest of the world. So that's what their fear is. So their attacks on Russia and China uh, were to try and bully those two countries to push them back. Since Russia and China have a commitment to sovereignty, sovereign development, and they found parallel interests and, and uh, moved into in increased collaboration. These Western geopoliticians are now saying, what can we do to break up that potential alliance? So in, instead of seeing the, uh, the, the potential for peace, they're trying to figure out how to continue with the goals of, of the unipolar world. Now, why not instead join in the development of Eurasia? 
For example, begin with the reconstruction of Afghanistan, where the United States could be a partner with Russia and China through something called the extended troika, where there's a humanitarian catastrophe which is emerging in Afghanistan. It's, it's not just emerging, we're actually in the midst of it. Why not work together to show that we can cooperate to resolve these kinds of confrontations and crises, especially in a place which is the center of what was called the great game going back to the middle of the 19th century, the Russian-British competition over Asia. How about reconstructing Iraq, Syria, Yemen, Libya? These are countries that were destroyed because of the regime change operations run by the unipolar powers. How about development of Africa, working with China instead of attacking China for working together with African nations to build up transportation, energy, healthcare systems, and so on. So forget the Green New Deal, dump the Great Reset. The problem is the Western financial system is bankrupt, hopelessly so, as Lyndon LaRouche has been pointing out since the shift occurred in, in 1971 into a consumer-driven free market economy based on looting of the developing sector, based on speculation and the destruction of the physical economy. Let's junk all that, cancel the debt, move with LaRouche's four laws for global financial bankruptcy reorganization. Cancel the debt, it's, it's gambling debt, it's worthless. It will never ever be repaid. Instead, implement Glass-Steagall banking regulation and Hamiltonian credit institutions, which will fund the development of modern platforms of infrastructure and especially research and development into the frontier areas of science where the future, uh, which, on which the future depends. That's why Helga Zepp-LaRouche said we must make 2022 the year of LaRouche. It's the 100th anniversary of his birth. His policies demonstrate both the failure of geopolitics to assure peace and stability in the world, but more importantly, offer based on the principles of the American system, which was based on the principles of the European Renaissance and, and science in coherence with the long-standing philosophical outlook of the Confucianism in China and so on. Why not go back to that kind of philosophical scientific approach and reject once and for all the geopolitics that come from the imperial warlords of the uh, Great Britain, the monarchy, the city of London. That's why 2022 must be the year of LaRouche. So we're seeing some motion in that direction. It's a good start. Let's make sure it happens. Thanks, and I'll see you again tomorrow.